Welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover various Commission activities um, and any topics of interest to Nebraska librarians and library staff. Um, we have C commission staff that do some presentations, and we have guest speakers come in sometimes. We do these sessions every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time. They are free, and we do record them. So if you are not able to watch one of our live sessions, you, we have a whole list of all our recordings from the whole last year we've been doing this um, available on our website. Um, this morning we are going to learn more about the um, people who do the talking book and braille service, how they do all that behind the scenes. And I'm just going to pass it on to you guys to introduce yourself and go right ahead. Sounds good. Should I turn this on? Um, sure. Okay. Hi, my name is Scott Schultz, and I'm the circulation and audio production coordinator for the Talking Book and Braille service. And uh, we have a few other folks with us here today, too. I'll let you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves. Do I need to turn the mic? Oh, no, you should, you should, oh, okay. should be okay. I'm Bonnie Feynman, and I'm a volunteer narrator for the Talking Book service. I'm Bill Ainsley, the studio manager for our two talking book studios who tries to help organize the magazines and books and keep all of the projects rolling. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, we weren't sure a good place to start, so we decided to go ahead and put together a little video for everyone to check out. Um, we figured that might be a way to kind of introduce you to what it actually looks like down there since we don't have, you know, like a video camera to go walk around down there. So this uh, video is also on YouTube. You can search for recording a Nebraska talking book and it will pop up. And we just wanted to kind of show you the whole process of recording a book from uh, from book selection all the way through to books being duplicated and circulated to people. So here's a little video for you to check out. And um, as you watch this, if you want to uh, you know, think of any questions you might have, we can dig deeper into any aspect of this that, that anyone finds interesting. So uh, feel free to think of some questions here as we watch this. There is a public library for people who can't use print the Nebraska Library Commission Talking Book and Braille Service. Any Nebraskan who cannot see well enough to read regular print or cannot hold a book or turn its pages can get recordings of their favorite books and magazines for free by mail. The Talking Book and Braille Service has over 60,000 recorded book titles available for checkout on a wide variety of subjects. Fiction, nonfiction, romances, westerns, mysteries, histories, birds, fish, cookbooks, and many more. Many of our recordings come from the Library of Congress. We also operate our own recording studios to add to our collection books and magazines of particular interest to Nebraskans. The books we select for recording are mostly by Nebraska authors, such as Roger Welsh, Ted Kuzier, and Tom Osborne, or books with subjects related to Nebraska or the Great Plains, such as Nebraska Moments and the Complete Roadside Guide to Nebraska. We also record 20 different magazine titles, including Nebraska Farmer, Nebraska Land, Nebraska History, Nebraska Life, Cappers, Grit, Big Red Report, Country, and Midwest Living. Our recordings are produced in two small studios operated within our facility. Typical recording sessions are 90 minutes or two hours. A narrator reads one copy of a book or magazine into a microphone in a small room. In another small room, a producer operates a computer with recording software while following along with another copy of the text. There is a window between the two rooms, and the narrator and producer can talk to one another using microphones and small speakers or headphones. The words in the printed text are recorded exactly as they are written. If any mistakes are made, the recording is stopped and started again at the beginning of a good sentence or phrase. We strive for perfect accuracy. Before books and magazines go to the studio, they go through a process we call mapping. In order to make recording sessions run more smoothly and to make sure nothing is missed, marks are placed in the book or magazine to create an order for the recording. This is especially important in magazines, where an article might start on page 10, jump to page 20, and jump again to page 80. After recording the main text of an article, we may need to go back and record extra elements like photograph captions, tables, and sidebars. One of the hardest parts of recording books and magazines is pronunciation. Narrators have access to several dictionaries and pronunciation guides in their recording spaces. We have additional specialty pronunciation guides outside of our studio area, and we also attempt to look up some words by using online resources. We have compiled a list of online pronunciation resources that librarians can also use through the Nebraska Access website at nebraskaaccess.ne.gov slash pronunciation.asp. When recording is finished, books and magazines go through a process called post-production. At this stage, we can make many kinds of adjustments to the recordings to make them sound their best. 
Volume levels can be adjusted up and down. EQ can be added to improve voices. Sibilance, loud S sounds, and plosives, loud P and B sounds, can be reduced. Extraneous breathing sounds can be removed. And recordings can be made slightly longer or shorter as needed. Books go through an additional stage of review, in which a volunteer reviewer listens to a recording while following along with a copy of the text, to further ensure that the recording is accurate and noise-free. Any problems found at this point can be re-recorded before a book circulates. When recordings are finished, they are duplicated onto cassettes, and then sorted into mailbags for delivery to our patrons. Magazines are sent out when finished, similar to print magazine subscriptions and books are shelved and either requested specifically by patrons or sent out because a patron has indicated interest in particular authors or subjects. We are in the middle of a transition to a new format. While we currently create materials for cassette, as we have since the 1970s, we are beginning to work in a new media format called the Digital Talking Book. These books will be circulated on cartridges, which are a specialized form of USB flash drive. This format allows for easy navigation between articles or chapters, but in order for that to work, our recordings will have to go through a new process called markup. In markup, navigation markers are added to the recordings, which can be used by our new players to navigate through books. Our new players and cartridges started arriving in August of 2009. Over the next several years, we will continue to receive more players, and eventually all of our patrons will have them. At the same time, more books in this new format will continue to arrive, and we will be creating Nebraska books and magazines to work with these players, too. These books are very easy to use, and the sound quality is great. We're very excited about the future of Talking Books. Um, you want to go over to the web page? Or? Oh, um, yeah, let's... Because the PowerPoint just says that. Okay, yeah, let's, let's do that. And you are good to go. Okay, all right, so that was our um, initial video. Um, I guess let's see if we have any questions or anything yet. Here, I'll get my control panel pulled up here. Let's see, audience. Did I just go to questions here? Okay, yeah, yeah. okay looks like we're good to go for now. Okay, um, a few things um, to dig into the video a little further. Uh, first of all, um, we have more people than just myself <laughs> working down there. Uh, we just tried to shoot the video really quickly, and so I just ran around and to each of the stations to kind of get some basic footage. Um, but volunteers do help us immensely. I do have some statistics with me um, to illustrate um, how much they help us. Um, from October 1st of 2008 to September 30th of 2009, we had 49 different studio volunteers that contributed 2,300 volunteer hours. And um, for the Talking Book and Braille service total, we had 118 volunteers who contributed 4,350 hours. So that's roughly what we get in terms of help from volunteers in a given year, which is immense, and it, it helps us tremendously. We couldn't do what we do without them. Um, in the studios, volunteers uh, help us with narration. They do virtually all the narration. Uh, we do have a few volunteers who help us with uh, being producers who actually run the recording equipment. And we have a volunteer reviewer who listens back to the books, as we saw in part of the video clip there. Uh, we also do have some volunteers over in the tape duplication area who do quality checking, uh, which with that, basically, once we duplicate tapes, we'll have people listen to the beginnings and ends and fast forward, kind of spot check in them, because sometimes the duplication equipment won't work the way you want, or a cassette tape might have a, a physical flaw as well, so we'll find those before we send those out to patrons. Um, with shifting the collection, we have volunteers who help with that, which is um, just moving books around so that we can make room for new things as they come in and really a variety of different clerical projects up in our uh, Reader's Advisory area as well. Um, and Bonnie Feynman, who's with us, uh, has been a volunteer with us for quite a while. Uh, let's check with Bonnie on a few questions just to kind of talk about the studio volunteer experience as narrators. Um, let's see, I'll, I have a few questions we could start with here, and then if anyone else has any questions, feel free to jump in as well. Um, Bonnie, how long has it been that you've been volunteering as a I think it's been roughly seven or eight years, Scott, and that would be uh, once a week. Fantastic. Um, what's your favorite thing about coming in to be a volunteer narrator? I love doing the narrating. I know that sounds <laughs> like repetitious, but I love sitting there, and uh, it's like my own little radio show. I guess it's kind of an ego trip. <laughs> really, though, um, 
I'm 66 years old, so I've had a lot of jobs in my life. I've been a teacher and a legal secretary and a social worker, and this is my favorite job, I do oh, have wow. to say, because of the uh, product of what we're doing. I love reading, I love books, and I love the idea of people who want to read and are physically kept from doing so, being able to access reading material through this means, and um, that's what I like, oh, and the people I work with. <laughs> yeah, we try to have fun. As we, as we <laughs> they paid me to say that one. <laughs> Not, no, kidding, kidding. No pay. <laughs> you, know, you were saying, uh, uh, you had a story earlier that you were talking about that might be fun to interject here too. Bonnie's also done some reporting before she came to volunteer with us that sounded really interesting in contrast to what, what you all just saw in our, our recording studios here. Uh, Technology has come a long way, and so uh, Bonnie's had some experiences to contrast with that. I have, um, I, I sort of took it from womb to tomb in terms of my, I guess the other way around. Anyway, <laughs> from the very beginning to, to our modern system, I first began recording for a um, visually impaired Jesuit at Creighton University on a very, very basic, um, primitive manner. I had a cassette player, and I had little cassettes, and he would tell me what he wanted me to record, and he'd give me something to read from. And I would take it home to my kitchen table and put the cassette player on the, play, on the table and start to read wonderful, exciting things like the minutes of the Jesuit Congress in Rome uh, in the late 1980s, um, that sort of thing. And um, what was interesting about it, it was very, very primitive. If a dog barked, I had to stop, back up, and tape over myself. The same for traffic on the street outside because I was at 40th and coming in mm -hmm. Omaha, which was rather busy. You got to thinking of the traffic as sort of ocean noise in the background. Anyway, that was very, very basic and primitive. And then I went from there to, uh, well, doing some reading for my husband when we were engaged. My husband happens to be uh, visually impaired, but with him it was just recording things that helped him with his job and with his his. Um, his professional and just daily living things like reading the bills and things like that. That's mm -hmm. not exactly recording, but it is narrating in a way. Oh, yeah. Then I came to the Library Commission, and when I first came here, we were still doing the recording on cassettes. Uh, I don't know all the technology, but we were just be sort of oh, yeah, beginning, you know. And then we well. started to have more software, and they're using more computers, and I don't understand all of that, but I know it goes more smoothly now. And now that we're going with the digital, with that coming up, um, I think I have pretty well gone through various <laughs> stages. So. Right. Yeah, yeah Bill, if you wanted to jump in there, too, on the studios, we have um, computer technology, of course, like with every other area of life, I guess at this point, has definitely made some big changes. Mm -hmm to the way that we record things, too, and uh, we switched, was it about six or seven years ago, Bill? Back in 04, we, we finally got rid of those huge, lumbering tape recorders. We used to have huge, they were probably three foot high, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, and everything was done on reel-to-reel -reel tape. The, the reels were cut to the length of the cassettes, that is 88 minutes, which means that there was about 1,650 feet of tape on one of those reels, which was fun when it all unraveled on your desk. <laughs> Fortunately, with the, with the WAV files that we're using now, we don't have that problem. Plus, there's so many more things that you can do with WAV files. When we were doing the reel-to-reel -reel tapes, you were pretty much, what you had on the tape was it, period. You couldn't really change anything. The volumes were set. The times were absolutely set. It was a real difficult thing to go back and fix something after the fact because you had to make sure that it fit absolutely down to the tenth of a second within the original time period for that recording. Mm -hmm. But now with the WAV files, we can, we can make the files a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, without changing the pitch of the narrator's voice. So nobody's mm -hmm. going to sound like a chipmunk and they're not <laughs> going to sound really deep as you stretch it out. And we can change the cadence a little bit. We can, we can take out breaths, take out extraneous sounds. Of course, Bonnie never makes any of those extraneous sounds. I was just sounds. thinking, no breathing allowed. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I tell people that our narrators go six hours without breathing. <laughs> the walls in those rooms down there are blue because they don't breathe. <laughs> and uh, 
No, you can do many more things with the with the wave files than we could with the tape machines. Plus, having a lot more space on the desk. Mm. The computers are much smaller, of course. But there are around thirty people who volunteer in the studios. The, the volunteer narrators. We have two volunteer producers who run the computer while we're doing the recording. The producer's function is to follow along with another copy of the book or the magazine. And if someone makes a mistake, or if they breathe too heavily, or if the chair squeaks, or if the phone rings, we stop and we'll reset to the beginning of the sentence and go again. And hopefully to the folks at home, it all sounds seamless. Most of the work for the, particularly for the books, with, with books we have one voice per book. The same narrator will start the book and finish the book, go, go cover to cover. And with the books, many of the narrators will do quite a bit of advanced preparation. They'll check with the author on how to pronounce the names of the characters or places. They may call the, the drug store to find out what's the name of the drug, or call the post office in the little town that's mentioned in the book to find out how do you say the name of that little town. So there's, and they, and they may spend 15 or 20 minutes per session looking in our dictionaries that we have in the studios or online. So there's quite a bit of preparation that goes on the part of the narrators that goes into working on the books. The magazines are pretty much red coal. We want to pump them out on a timely fashion. We'll still call the drugstore, still call the publisher, but usually with a magazine, the narrator comes in and one narrator picks up where the previous narrator left off, so they're reading the magazines cold. Now the producers or somebody else will go through ahead of time and mark through the magazines as you were just seeing in that video, because magazines may jump from page 20 to page 60 to page 80, and back again to page 20 for photo captions. So there's always instructions in those magazines as to what to read next. Okay. And we have two volunteer producers in the studios, and then there's, uh, there's three of us staffers doing the produ production work in the studios, myself, you, and uh, Kate Kramer. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And of course, when, when Bonnie comes in, we try to leave the most complicated parts of magazines to read. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Left off, so. Tables, charts. <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah, that leads into, um, um, what's your we least We had favorite? some comments I just oh, wanted to yeah. grab a little on um, someone at the Library Commission when you were talking earlier. Um, great volunteer to have at the session. So much history of recording. They like that. Oh. Um, and um, thanks to you, Bill, on what really happens <laughs> behind right. the scenes. <laughs> the blue walls. <laughs> <laughs> the blue walls, exactly. <laughs> well, it's, all, it's all totally clean. The blue walls are because they're not allowed to breathe. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but when we do let out a press, you can hear it all the way down to the state capitol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with, with, um, is there anything that you don't like about Mary and Bonnie? Mm -hmm. I did make some notes. You made some notes? Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought we might get to that question. Well, sure. No, um, it's not the, the process, it's the, the product sometimes that I don't care for. Tables and charts are very difficult to read. They become, well, they, they blur <laughs> from one yeah. column to the next. If, and we have a magazine about hunting, and I personally love Bambi, so I have my, <laughs> my moments of not wanting to call all those deer that eat all our baby lettuce. But what I don't like about those magazines are when they talk about the details, the technology of hunting deer, and they're collecting deer urine and using things like that to lure the deer. I think it should be a level playing field, and I think they should all use bows and arrows, the hunters, not the deer. And, uh, then the other thing I didn't care for as much was I had a very dull book. Luckily, I don't remember the title or the author. And it's, uh, the, the plot was boring, and it had a lot of Spanish in it. And Spanish is not the language I'm best at. I have some French. And so and it was just not a fun book. But I have had many more things that were fun. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> Um, do you prefer recording books or, or magazines, or do you have a preference at all? I prefer books because of the continuity. You sure. keep going in a smoother fashion, even if you do it in various sessions. You can't read a whole book in one session. And uh, as far as types of things I like to read, did you want that? Oh, sure. Um, I, have, I thought about that a lot um, because I knew that I was going to come in early today. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I like reading poetry. I like poetry very much. And I think I'm good at reading poetry, and we all tend to like doing what we 
thing yeah. we're good at. Cookbooks came up um, last mm -hmm. week, and I thought, gee whiz, I am kind of good at reading recipes, and there's a market for that. There are a lot of people that would like to cook if they had fun uh, recipes, and we have some great Nebraska cookbooks, I understand. Right. And then um, the other, I mentioned poetry. Okay, the, the thing I've enjoyed most, one of the things I've enjoyed most that we've done in the studio was a, th a book by Ted Couser that had a series that involved three different voices, and it was like a little play within a play, and I got to do the woman's voice, and then Scott was doing one man's voice, and Bill was doing another person's voice, and then we went back and forth. And yeah, that was, that, was, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was something we haven't done much of. Mm -hmm. That's another reason I like books, though, because you can do dialogue, and it's a challenge to, to make it clear what person's speaking because you don't have the quotation marks in front of you when you're listening. That's right. Yeah, that was an unusual book for, uh, it was a Ted Kuser book, I believe, and mm -hmm. it, was, um, it goes against what we said earlier about having one narrator on each book, which um, sure. we, I think that's the only exception to that I can think of offhand. I think so. Mm -hmm. It's the only one I've done. Yeah, that was really fun. We got, um, it was sort of like being in a great big multi-track studio for mm -hmm. a day, and we had um, you and Bill both set up, and I did some reporting on that, and yeah, that was really fun. It was fun. about a blizzard, so we had various... Yeah, I think People it was the recalling the blizzard. Mm -hmm. yeah. We do have a question. Um, uh, yes. Do you have narrators that opt out of a book if it's not their style? That is a good question. Yes. Oh, that's, yeah, Bill, that's Bill, Bill can speak. We can't make it. anybody record anything. So there are people who say, I do not want to do this book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that's fair. And the narrators get some choice of their book beforehand. In fact, I have always chosen my book. I wouldn't have chosen that one, and I know. <laughs> but um, there are books, we don't edit, so there are books that have raw language or have some sexual content, and we warn, I don't say we, like the narrator doesn't do it, but the producer or somebody would tell the reader beforehand that this might be the reader, the client, the, the uh, customer. Um, that this might be a book that has some explicit mm -hmm. things, and then they're warned. So the narrator would, would not choose that book if mm -hmm. it were something that offended that narrator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've had an occasional narrator that would read the book but wanted to use a stage name we rather did. than have their own name associated ah. with the book and prove that. Hmm. Yes, I can think hmm. of one of those since, yeah, in the last few years it was kind of interesting to you. The narrator you know, was perfectly happy to finish the book, but once mm -hmm. they got about halfway in, they really weren't enjoying it. Content, so and, and very, excuse me, oh, no. and Scott, but very few of our books are the kind that I refer to that people would find objectionable. But, you know, there's, yeah. a, there's yeah. an audience for everything, and mm -hmm. that's what I try and remember. This may not be the place to insert it, but what I try to do to get me through things like the deer hunting or the columns or whatever is I think somebody out there is listening to this because they want to know it. Right. So I try to talk to that person, even if it's not a subject that I myself enjoy. Yeah, there's an aspect to this, too, that I think well, some librarians might be interested to um, find out about, too. Since um, most of our correspondence with patrons is done through the mail and through telephone contact, um, it's a little different than a typical library in that we have a recording software system, or not, sorry, recording software system, our uh, catalog is um, through a program called Reads from the Library of Congress. And unlike most libraries, we do have to keep you know, a fairly explicit file of what interests a patron has, um, both specific interests on particular titles or authors, but also just general things like do they prefer westerns or romances, mysteries, etc. And um, because of that, we can send books out that might be keyed into certain interests that they have. And kind of related to books that may have you know, content that might be offensive to people, we can put some exclusions in their file if they don't want to hear strong language, mm -hmm. uh, if they don't want incredibly long books, because of course those recordings can end up being pretty epic, you know, Moby Dick on cassette takes <laughs> a very long time to listen to, so um, we can do exclusions for length or language, um, sexual content, violent content, things like that. Um, so again, we don't censor anything, we record word for word exactly what's on the page, but you know, in case the patrons might you know, have an interest, because these books are being played aloud too, Say if someone lives in a nursing facility, they may not want to be listening to a book with a lot of you know explicit language, you know, with their their potential roommates around or something. So it's a little different than, than reading a printed book sometimes in that aspect. So we do have ways to to help patrons out with that. Um, let's see, um, a few more questions for Bonnie, I guess too. Um, what is your favorite project that you've recorded here, or some you know, favorite moments in the studio, favorite magazines, etc. Wow. I think I 
sort of covered that when I said yeah. I like doing, you know, poetry yes. and uh, novels where there's a lot of dialogue and a challenge to keep keep that going. I've never had a bad day here. Oh, I think I did once. Once I went home with my nose out of joint because I thought I knew how to pronounce a foreign word. And <laughs> Bill thought he knew how to pronounce it. And, it. and it was a draw. And, of course, I had to go with the producer because I'm only a volunteer. <laughs> There's no such thing as only a volunteer, by the way. It's like secretaries. Secretaries run companies. Mm -hmm. Volunteers run organizations. Pronunciation is mm. incredibly complicated, but, too. Uh, it's, yes, it's amazing. Yes. Um, and, well, the one, one thing you asked what I enjoyed doing um, – I learned something, and I always enjoy learning. Mm -hmm. I learned that even though Midwesterners are supposed to have the most accent-free mm -hmm. voices of speech, sure. speech of, okay. of anybody in the country, which is why we have so many telemarketers in <laughs> Nebraska. That, that, that's that is true. true. That is that's true. true. But I, I learned that I had more of an accent than I realized. I had to learn not to say Washington, oh, yeah. but to say Washington. So that's, right. that's just a little that's example. A good one. I answer the question? No, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Part of the job of, of, of the producer is being a speech coach, just like Bonnie was saying, uh, Washington instead of Washington, or doing the clothes to, to wash your sure, clothes. Yeah. Those are the things we look for. Um, we do have Midwesternisms. Almost nobody here ever goes up on the roof of the house. They always go up on the roof. roof. So we have an accent, too, just that our accent happens to be the one that is preferred in the broadcasting business. <laughs> That's right. That's a good way of putting it. But the principal job of the, of the producer is to be the speech coach, to sometimes stop the, the narrator and say, are you sure of that word? Look it up in the dictionary. Or, you know, if we just change the emphasis, put this little pause here, instead of after the word, it changes the entire meaning of the sentence. So you think about how do you want to do that sentence? Excellent. Looks like we have another question that came in, too. Uh, the question is, how do you select the books that are read? And I can address that a little bit. Uh, Dave Ortley, the director of the Talking Book and Braille Service, um, does the actual selection, but I at least have some understanding of how, that, how he goes about doing that. Um, it's pretty typical compared to other types of collection development, except that in our case, our, our policy is focused on books that are either about Nebraska or the Great Plains or potentially authors that are from Nebraska or the Great Plains area. So the, the primary focus is really on those, those particular subjects, um, which makes sometimes finding out about books a little bit more complicated than, you, than it would be, you know, reading the New York Times bestseller list or something like that. Um, we do have some magazines that we record that have book reviews, so we'll send those up to Dave. Um, the Nebraska History and Nebraska Life come to mind. They both do some nice book reviews that are kind of involved enough that we can tell if it will be a book that's worth checking out. Um, recommendations come in from patrons sometimes. We'll definitely give those a consideration. Borrowers make recommendations. Borrowers, na narrators. And volunteers make suggestions too. That's right, yeah. So we'll, we'll definitely take anything into consideration that, that people bring up and we'll pass those all on to Dave and he'll try to find a copy of the book to, you know, to examine. Uh, in, in some cases it can even be difficult to record a book, but you know, if the, if the information seems really important and a great asset to the collection, we'll go ahead and try to find a way to record it. I know we have a few books, there's one I can think of right now that's pending on being recorded that's extraordinarily complicated, but it's a really neat book, and it'll be interesting to, to get out once we manage to figure out how to do it. So, <laughs> We record about 30 books a year in our studios, but the concentration is on magazines. We do right. something like 150 issues of magazines. Yeah, I might, have, I might have the staffs on magazines here somewhere. Um, yeah, about 138 issues of magazines came out last year. Um, we have eight, 89 different titles that we offer from the service. 19 of those are actually recorded in our studios. The, the others come from some other sources. But um, that's a lot of material. We do more magazines than the typical talking book library. And uh, when we do record those, we, as Bill said earlier, too, we try to focus on timeliness, um, which means that we will switch narrators as we do them. But you know, we want to try to get them in patrons' hands you know, within a week or so when someone would get the print. So works out pretty well. Could I insert something oh, that's, that's, that's just sort of funny and fun? I have been recommending a book online to several friends that I email with because I finished it, and the book's title is not relevant because I don't think we'll be recording it. Mm -hmm. However, in the process of recommending that book, it occurred. I mentioned several times, have we ever heard of a good seller? No, it's always a bestseller, right? <laughs> and do people ever lowly recommend anything? No, we always... 
highly recommend it, right? That's true. Very End true. of funny. End of parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Um, Bonnie, is there um, anything that's, that you think of as a challenge to being a narrator? Or you know, if someone tuning into this wants to uh, try to become a volunteer narrator, is there anything you'd recommend that they should work on in terms of skills? or um, Read. <laughs> read, read, read. The more you read, the more you're going to be able to read out loud. Mm -hmm. If you have read to children, that's great experience. I happen to have been a teacher. That was good experience. Um, I think if you look, if you really, in all seriousness, if you love to read, you're going to be able to read out loud mm -hmm. as long as you don't, as long as you don't speak sloppily in the first place. You know, like if you slur all the time, I don't want to do a demonstration, but, <laughs> you know, um, you have to be a person who, who does have clear diction, but they have an audition process, so they're going to weed out anyone that's totally voiceless, clueless. Yeah, you, yeah, somebody Bill else can talk about yeah, that. Yeah, maybe Bill knows all about the audition process as he, he runs all the auditions. So. Well, in our auditions, we have people read samples of about every type of material that we have. There's some fiction. There's a uh, more or less a legalistic piece. There's a table, there's a description of how to build a wood duck nest box. And we want to see what the people will do with each one of those sections. With the auditions, we don't stop and fix things. We want to see how the people sound. Do they make too many mistakes? Uh, do they do a good job describing the duck box, how to assemble the duck box? How do they do with all of the numbers and the names in the legalistic piece? What do they do with the characters? in the fiction. That's what we're looking for in the audition. So we're looking there, how does their voice sound, those characteristics, and how many mistakes do they make? Those are two really big factors in the audition process. In fact, I think most of the people who take the auditions do not pass. That's true, especially lately it seems like maybe 25% make it through, so it's been pretty low lately. But, mm -hmm. but, uh, that doesn't mean we don't want you to keep trying, everybody, so... Um, you get a lot of people that do want to? Um, yeah, we probably do, what, one or two auditions a month or something oh, like wow, that. Oh, wow, really? You do not have to have the golden throat to pass the audition. <laughs> it's just how, how well do you sound, how well do you interpret the material? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, accuracy and interpretation, again, become really critical. So, you know, sometimes, you know, folks will come to us with, you know, maybe broadcast backgrounds, um, theater backgrounds, things like that, as well as avid readers. Um, a lot of you know, retired professors, teachers, instructors, things like that. So it's uh, it works out really well. Um, let's see. For any other questions, oh, um, Bonnie, do you do any special preparations with books uh, at home before you come mm -hmm. in? If I excuse me, I have a frog in my throat, and that happens in the studio, so I have to clear my. <laughs> Do you want to ask some other question, and I'll come back in a second? Oh, absolutely. Oh. Well, you know, one thing we could do, too, uh, I wanted to mention the, the new players that we got as well, too. Oh, Bonnie's back. So. <laughs> Ta-da! And, and it does, it just it happens. If you're reading, and you're reading for a half an hour or an hour, toward the end of the two-hour session, for example, you'll be reading a lot less well than you were when you first came in. That's true. What was the question? <laughs> oh, yes, um, yeah, the question was any, any sort of preparations that yes, you might do Yes, if, if I have a book, I usually have the opportunity to take it home with me for at least a week or, or so beforehand, and maybe not read it, because I read better cold. I, mm -hmm. I really do. I just happen to be a person who does, in my own opinion, anyway, read better um, without a lot of rehearsal. But I like to go through it, see what it's about, see if there are any stumbling blocks that I need to be prepared for, any foreign phrases, any um, anything that might embarrass me if I were picking it up off the shelf myself. I, I read everything, though, so... I mean myself personally. I bought my sister a bracelet for Christmas, and it says, I read banned books. And it has little <laughs> copies of all the banned books around it. I am very anti-censorship when it comes to books. And I think all librarians are. So. Yeah. Bonnie's been able to put up with this for quite a while, for quite a long time, because when you're doing one of the narration sessions from the standpoint of a narrator, it's like giving a two-hour speech mm. with someone constantly interrupting you to tell you what you're doing wrong. <laughs> and you have to be, you have to have the patience of Job and to, to not get, it, it's not personal, you just have to realize that everybody wants to do it properly, and I've often figured that if we ever started to get lax and just let things go, that the narrators would quit because they want it right also. 
Absolutely. <laughs> Very nice. Um, well, one thing I wanted to mention, too, uh, not directly related to the studios, but I guess related to the things that are coming out of the studios, are, uh, well, the last time we did one of these presentations was about a year ago, and we were talking about the, the upcoming new digital book, um, talking about players, which at the time still weren't out, and since that time they actually have come out. So I do have um, the website here where we can uh, take a quick look at what these new books will look like here, too. Uh, let me go to the What's New section of the National Library Service site, and I can show you some pictures of these. Um, we saw these at the very end of the video clip as well, but let me uh, zoom in on this picture here. Hopefully this, there we go. That works in the screen fairly well. Um, they're fairly small, a little bit smaller than the cassette players that we've been using, and they're roughly the same weight. Um, they're really nice and sturdy machines. Um, in fact, currently, they started coming in August of 2009, which I think we mentioned in the video. Uh, right now, we have 441 of them out in the hands of, of Nebraska patrons all over the state. And we hope, you know, over the next year to two years, we'll have them out to everyone. Um, currently, we serve around 4,100 Nebraskans. So, you know, it's the percentage is starting to climb up. I think everyone will have them fairly soon. We continue to get shipments of them basically on a monthly basis. Um, the books are coming in as well. I think we have, uh, I didn't grab the exact numbers, but there's around 1,000 different book titles in right now. Um, in contrast with the cassette collection, there's around 60,000 titles, so there's a ways to go on that, but they're, they're coming in pretty quickly. I, they're coming in just as fast as I can get them on shelves at this point. So, um, Can they see my cursor on the screen, too, by chance? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, let me use this as a little pointer here, too, to give you a quick overview of the machine. Um, the cartridge over here to the right of the player um, is basically like a flash drive. Um, the USB connector is over here on the right of it and uh, it's flush with the edge of the machine. Uh, there's only one way to insert it in the machine, which as you can see this one here, there's that circle, a little hole cut out on one side, and it's beveled so that it only fits in one way. Uh, they're very easy to push in and out. Uh, they're quite easy to use. Uh, the yellow buttons over here on the right side of the player are volume up and volume down. Oh, and coincidentally, I, I have one of the machines with me. Uh, you can't see the one here, but I can at least demonstrate that the machine has a user guide built into it, and it also talks to you as soon as you turn it on to tell you what the buttons do. So for example, let me go ahead and turn this on here. Player on. I'll turn the volume up for a little bit. Okay. So, so what happens with this is if you push a button, it'll actually tell you what that button does. So you can learn the machine rather intuitively just by literally banging on buttons until you get what you want. So for instance, if I hit the volume up button, I get this. Volume up. To increase the volume by one step, press the volume up button. There are 15 volume steps. So it tells you really everything you'd want to know. If I press the play button, it'll explain how you can use it to play and to stop. Play, stop. To start or stop playing a book, use the large play stop button. When the book is playing, press this same button to stop the player. When you press play again, the book will continue playing where you last stopped. When you have explored all the buttons... Well, I'll stop it. It goes on and on. You can also... <laughs> Coincidentally, there's a way to change the verbosity level of those two so that once you have learned the machine, you don't have to listen to the speech every time. So um, that play button, coincidentally, is the green button kind of in the center of the machine here. Uh, there's rewind and fast forward on either side of that. The power button is this red button over here that has a little depression in the center. And there's a sleep button here, which people are really excited about. Uh, we do have a lot of people who use the service who like to listen to a book as they go to sleep, but you don't want to lose your page. And, uh, you know, with, uh, with these books, since you don't have to flip cassette sides as you did with the old books, it could really keep on trucking and you're, you know, potentially eight hours away from where you were the day before. Oh, yes, one. Yeah, could I interject? I haven't seen this before. Oh, and sure. it's, kind of, it's kind of cool. The sleep button is shaped like a little crescent moon. That's right. So, and it's probably deliberate, but I think it it's is. fun, too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you have options between, I think, 15, 30, 45 minutes and an hour that you can set the sleep for as well. So, um, um, if you're a... You know, it's really a light sleeper, awesome. you can leave it on for an hour. So, yeah, it'll be really nice. There, there is a, a headphone jack um, on the right side of the machine over mm -hmm. here. And uh, the thing kind of, I don't know if you can see this very well, but right next to that is a little cap. And if you pull that cap off, that's a USB slot as well. So that mm -hmm. um, if you use our BARD service, which is a download service from the Library of Congress, patrons can sign up for that. And once they sign up, they can download books that can also be just placed onto a flash drive and inserted into that slot on the side or they can use a blank cartridge mm -hmm. as well, but those aren't very easy to come by yet. Mm -hmm. um, they're on the way, though.
I, I would just like to say from looking at this and knowing what my husband as a user is presently using from the Library of Congress, that's kind of redundant there, but um, this will be so much easier for my husband to use, and he is completely blind and has been from birth, but he'll love this one. He'll, he'll really like it. It should be coming soon, too. So in fact, I did bring a book along, just so I don't know if you can hear the audio quality of this very well over um, the, the connection here, but I'll give it a shot. Um, we're just starting to work on figuring out this, this mapping. There's a bunch of different standards that one has to follow to, to get these books to play properly. Uh, the audio gets converted into a specialized format and then encrypted to meet the Library of Congress standards. Uh, the Chafee Amendment requires that the things we circulate are in a specialized format. And for us, in this case, the specialized format itself is encryption. But the, the format itself is fairly obscure at this point, too. Uh, the DTB format itself changes the audio into, well, just to bore you, it's uh, AAC is the file extension. It's an AMR wideband plus audio, which is, comes from the cell phone industry. So these are basically like very, very long cell phone ringtones. <laughs> wow. So, uh, sure. for instance, if I pop this book in, this is Heart of a Husker that we recorded in our studios here. And I'm still working on getting this thing to navigate completely properly. Everything works except for the very beginning, but it's that will probably work by this afternoon. So you just push it in, and it'll... Heart of a Husker. Tom Osborne's Nebraska Legacy. Current position. Chapter 4, Osborne said. And it jumped in on Chapter 4 because that's where I took it out last. If I want to skip around, there's previous buttons on this advanced player, so let's go back to... I'll hit play. But I would... Chapter 4. Fi chapter 3. Chapter 2. So you can, you can skip around in chapters like that. Um, I don't know in a book, especially a fiction book, that that's that useful, but certainly for people who read magazines or nonfiction books, cookbooks, as, as was brought up earlier, this is going to be fantastic, much, much easier to navigate than having to fast forward and listen for beefs as we do on the... Especially if you're sounds. cooking while you're reading the recipe. That's right. I mean, yeah. really, that would be a point. Mm -hmm. You can quickly pause it. And, yeah, there are two versions mm -hmm. of the player as well. The, the photo that's up on your screen right now that, that everyone's seeing is what's called the basic player or the standard player. But there's also a player called the advanced player where uh, there's a line about halfway up, kind of where the speaker is for the top here. There's a, four more buttons on that player right in this line here. Um, otherwise, the machine's identical. And those, those are navigation-related buttons. So for people who do a lot of cooking, for instance, that's probably a preferable machine for them. Mm -hmm. um, I have the advanced player up here with me because I'm testing that navigation, so uh, it just has these uh, one, two, three, four, five extra buttons, basically, but otherwise it's identical. So. These features that Scott is talking about is something we could have never done with the with the tape machine. That's mm -hmm. right. And so right now we have much more post-production, as we call it, than we, than we uh, used to have. Mm -hmm. There's many things that go on in post-production. Scott, you might want to talk about that because it's all part of the product that the folks get at home. That's right, yeah. Since since all the audio is recorded digitally now, we can do a lot more editing in the digital domain, too. Uh, the video mentions a few of the basic things, running uh, compression to balance volume levels out, especially, say, on magazines where you have multiple narrators. We can go through and just make sure that the, the volume levels don't jump between narrators and things like that. Um, we can take out some extraneous noises, especially things like sibilance and plosives that can be kind of irritating on cassette. We can totally remove those. And, you know, just generally get the audio sounding really, really clean before it gets copied into this new format. And this is going to have potentially a lot of work on the production and post-production side in terms of putting in the navigation markers. Um, it really depends on the book. Though. If it's a, a basic fiction book, it really may not be too bad, and we may not need to put markers between chapters because really it's, I can't think of any work of fiction I've read where I skipped the chapter and felt like I read the book necessarily. <laughs> so, you know, for some things it won't be bad at all, but for others, you know, we, cookbooks, for example, I know we do have a few cookbooks in the queue to, to work on. And, you know, we, we can dig down all the way to the ingredient level on those if, if we want. It's just a matter of you know, putting in the time to make that possible, and then, then it's ready to go. So. Mm -hmm. so, so now when we're done in the studio, we're just barely halfway done with the whole project. That's exactly right. Yeah, it does. It makes the project, you know, this, the studio time can potentially go even faster because we can tweak a lot of things after it's recorded uh, instead of having to make sure it's exactly right as it's recorded. It's kind of a funny trade-off that way, but yeah, this potentially adds a lot more time on the on the back end to finish our production, but, but it's really fun. So let's see, we have another question in, that's come through, which is how do I get to become a TBBS user? Um, you can contact us, which let me just bring up our contact info page quickly here so you can look at that. Uh, oh, it's in PowerPoint, I'm sorry. Let's see. Yes, and this is all completely free. It's done by mail, and we have a toll-free number for 
patrons who are outside of the Lincoln Lancaster County area. Um, here's our contact information in general. Um, let me speak to you a little bit on what it takes. Any resident of Nebraska who cannot see to read regular print or hold a book or turn its pages will qualify to use our service. Um, if you can't handle books or see to read even due to medication or while recovering from an accident or surgery, that also applies. You can uh, temporarily use the service if you need to. Um, reading disabilities that result from organic dysfunction, dyslexia in, in particular is what that's referring to. Um, that will be okay to, to work with the service as well. And all the books and magazines and playback equipment are sent back and forth to patrons, between, between us and patrons, completely free of charge uh, by mail. It's, it's all postage paid. Um, so there's really no cost at all. Um, we have uh, the phone numbers that are up here. We have a phone number where you can call in and talk to a reader's advisor who will get you set up with the service and uh, you know, find out what your preferences are in terms of what materials you would like, get you signed up for magazines, uh, different book preferences. Uh, we can take care of all of that for patrons. So, And uh, I think I mentioned earlier, we right now we serve about 4,100 uh, Nebraskans. So we'd love to serve another 4,100, so feel free to give us a call. So. May I ask, Scott, I'm not sure of this myself, but um, uh -huh. do we have people, I think we do, who would go, say, to a nursing home where someone had recently become a user to show them how to use the machine? Or do we tell somebody at the nursing home how to show them? Um, how does that work? Well, with these new machines, hopefully they won't, they're, they're fairly straightforward, they so I don't, I don't think they'll need too much, because okay. once they pop it out, it, it really, as long as you can find the on button, you're good to go. It'll, it'll explain well, a lot. What I think I'm thinking of is I... We're an aging population now, mm -hmm. and so many people are becoming visually impaired late in life. Yes. And I know several who would like a service like this but wouldn't have a clue as to how to begin to use a machine because they can't see the machine. Oh, sure. Is that just something where you would tell a friend to go and show them? Or, or yeah, well, the, a, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, the reader's the advisors will set up some of that with um, initially when we get an application form, mm -hmm. which you can call the numbers on the screen as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'll read those as well. It's 402-471-4038 uh, in Lincoln, Lancaster County, and 800-742-7691 uh, um, throughout the rest of the state. Um, once we get an application filled out, there's, there's a basic application that the, the patron or a friend or relative can help them fill out mm -hmm. and uh, send that back to us. And at that point, we'll give them a phone call and get them set up for the service and uh, send out a machine. The machine does have an instruction guide that comes with it, but the reader's advisors can also call and help them get things set up. Um, the cassette machines are, they can be kind of tricky because you have side selector switches to work with and speed switches that you might potentially need to change. And um, they can't read the instructions. And they can't read the instructions. Right. Yeah, there's a cassette that comes preloaded in the, in the uh, cassette player that if they just hit play, which you know, hopefully that button ends up being the, the one button that will make sure they know mm -hmm. where it is first. Um, once they hit play on that, it'll tell them a little bit about the machine. But you know, if there's any questions beyond that, definitely give us a call, and we'll we'll help them with anything we can. So, well, let's see. Did we have any more questions coming in? I think that covers most of the material we were going to look at today. Not yet. Nothing new. We haven't already gotten. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think we covered most of the material we wanted to. So, I'll wait a second here if any questions come through and. Otherwise, thanks again for tuning in, and uh, again, feel free to contact, contact us if you have questions about anything, if you want application forms, um, promotional information, um, if you want to volunteer, um, we've got volunteer applications as well. Really, any, any, anything you'd like, more questions about the studios, we'd be glad to answer anything we can. So, well, Thanks again to all of our volunteers. They do the work. I, basically, I tell people I just get paid to sit there and let them read to me. <laughs> 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 We're all to do it, huh? Fantastic, yeah. And one thing I, I love to get out there, too, is that, you know, I think our service is kind of a best-kept secret. Uh, a lot of people don't know about it, so you know, be sure to tell your, your friends and family about the service. Uh, it's really the, the best way for us to get the word out about it is word of mouth. You know, we try to do, you know, other promotional things and outreach, but that still seems to be the number one way to do it. So be sure to let people know about the service so that they can let somebody else know about it, and we can help out as many people as possible. There's just a, a little comment about oh, yes, we got a, appreciation. Yeah, we got a nice appreciation <laughs> message back, nice interaction between <laughs> all the speakers. Um, thank you very much. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you.
So, and thanks, Bonnie, again for coming in to speak to the volunteer experience for us as well. And uh, we will see you soon. You're welcome. I'll turn it back over to Christy here. Thank you very much. That was very yes. Like you said, it is a best kept secret, but it's good to. The more people know about it, the more I think they'll be interested and want to yeah. get people. You sure there's somebody you might know who could use the service who just doesn't know about it yet? Just be listening um. for Bonnie because in a few minutes she's going to be working on Nebraska Life magazine. All right. <laughs> Nebraska Life. Nebraska Life. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much. If there's no other questions, um, you do. If you do have questions, as you can see, you can contact um, the Hogan Book and Braille Service of the Commission here with this information. Um, and that will wrap it up for today. I hope you'll join us next week when we will have our monthly tech talk with Michael Sowers, the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Library Commission. Uh, thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>